And what is so good about chapter 5 is we are going to deal with justification. And this is a topic or doctrine or teaching that very few Christians really can grab onto. It. Because justification eliminates works completely. So, let's start with uh, 5.1. Who's got 5.1? I'm out of practice. Therefore, I didn't have it open. <laughs> oh, I Go got ahead. it. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so we have a therefore. So anytime we see a therefore, it's making a statement, and we need to re read the preceding verses. Okay. So let's start with uh, 23 and read all the way through 5. Okay. Now, was it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, knowing justification by faith will be an anchor for our life, especially when false doctrine and hard times challenge our lives. So many believers, guys, spend years being tossed to and fro by false teachers. Ephesians 4.14. Let's, let's look at Ephesians 4.14 real quick. Pretty familiar verse. Anybody got it? Just about there. Boy, this type is so small. Yeah, I got it. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about the every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning and craftiness of deceitful plotting. Wow. Okay, so we are talking about here leaders in the churches. People who are being tossed to and fro by false teaching. Trickery of men. So to have solid doctrine, solid teaching, solid understandings of what Christ did for us is key. So in verse 1 of chapter 5, therefore having been justified, now, last week we talked about what imputation was. Well, because of Christ's holiness, Christ's righteousness was imputed to us. His full righteousness was imputed to us, which made us 100% holy. So the Bible says that we are declared holy. Not made holy, but declared holy. So if God declares that you are holy... But yet, we are living in a sinful body. We struggle. And when we get to chapter 6, we will explain how to cut off that struggle. So this is why it's so important to get a hold on Romans, especially chapter 5. So this must be the teaching first for every new convert. So if we don't teach every new convert immediately what justification is, what imputation is, they'll find themselves going down the road of works-oriented teaching, trying to get close to God by works, or trying to get close to God by continual repentance, not by understanding what happened to them in Christ, and what Christ <clears throat> did for them by imputing his holiness to them, and declaring them righteous. And that's where a lot of believers have low self-esteem, low self-worth when they come to their prayer life. 
when it comes to their prayer life, when it comes to uh, their standing before God, they don't feel worthy. Go ahead, Jeff. Would it be depend on the maturity of the individual, or, or just you specifically say new beginners? Because somebody could be a baby for five years and don't have no clue. Yeah, and the question is, why are they a baby? Yeah. Because they've never been taught this. They've never been taught what happened to them in Christ. Okay. So now we've discovered that Christ imputed his holiness to us, made us righteous. He raised us with Christ from the dead. And it was for our justification. Therefore, verse 5, 1, having been justified, past tense, having been justified by faith, notice <clears throat> by faith, believing, faith, believing that Jesus Christ went to the cross, shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins. God accepted that penalty, excuse me, that penalty for sin, and God raised him from the dead, which is the proof of justification. The resurrection from the dead is a proof that God accepted that payment, Jesus Christ. Now, the first 10 verses were dealing with the method of justification, 1 through 10. Okay. And he said, go ahead, Lindell. No, I said okay. So, So we're not justified by works, but by faith. Works is a byproduct of the working out of the Holy Spirit in our life, what those works are. Now, notice he said we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that peace with God, meaning to bind together what has been separated. So because we are separated from God, Christ brought us together. So now we have peace with God. So one of the blessings of justification is peace. We have peace with God. No judgment. Okay. Now, the second blessing is in verse 2. Read verse 2. Oh, okay. Through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Okay. Now notice our second blessing. We also have what? Access oh, by faith. Okay. So, well, guys, we now have access by faith into grace in which we now stand. So this access, this new portal of coming to God has been opened up to us now. God the Father hears all of our prayers, all of our thoughts. The Holy Spirit has been sent to live inside of us and creates intercession for us. We have a two-way access point now that takes place constantly. You guys see it? Yeah. Okay. So, Colossians 1.20. Let's go to Colossians 1.20. And a lot of people get confused at you ever watch the old westerns where people say, you better make peace with your maker, buddy. Right. Better make peace with God. Yeah. Right? Well, guess uh, what, guys? You, you can't make your peace with God. Yeah, Colossians 1.20. Um, let's see. I'm halfway in the dark. And by him to reckon Okay. And by him to reconcile re reconcile all things to himself by him 
whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the cross, uh, through the blood of his cross. Okay, the only way we get peace is through the cross of Jesus Christ. It's the only way that peace came with, with us and God. There's no hostility between us and God anymore. God does not sit up there with his thumb being licked, just waiting to put his thumb on us anymore. No, we have complete access, and we have complete peace with God now. So, guys, if we don't get this straight, the devil might find a crack in our armor. He may find a crack in our doctrine and start tossing us around. We just read, we just read Ephesians. By false teaching, he can... We're tossed to and fro. So I find that many believers lose their confidence. They lose their hope because they don't understand the peace they have with God. They don't understand the access they have with God. So if we don't get it straight, uh, we can be tossed to and fro. Okay? So people get into false teaching because they don't understand justification, which leads them into works, thus causing them to doubt their relationship with God. So when a person gets into works, they don't know if they did enough right works to be accepted by God. So the believer turns into a lukewarm. Yes, yes which also leads to feelings of inadequacy or they're trying to live on a higher spiritual plane. Now, have you ever heard people use the term, I, I, I just want to get closer to God or it's used a lot of times in worship. I, I, I want to go to my higher praises. I want to go to a higher worship. Right. There's no such thing. There's no such higher plane you can go to. That's why we have to understand justification. Okay? Right. That's false teaching. You can't live in higher spiritual dimensions. There are no higher spiritual dimensions. Wow. You are justified. You are declared righteous. You're not made righteous. You're declared righteous. You still live in a sin, fallen body. But that can be cut off according to Romans 6, 12, which we'll get to in a little bit. So the Bible tells us that anything other than faith is sin. So we are saved by faith in what Christ did. Not in our faith, but we have faith in what Christ did. So to hear from God is through his word and finding it in the scriptures. So when people want to do personal testimonies, sure, that is that is good, and that's okay if you compare it to scriptures. But to hear God is hearing it through his word and confirming what this says. Okay, so that's what we're doing here tonight. So verse 2, access. So by faith into grace. So the provision was provided by God and Jesus Christ. So God and Jesus Christ together provided the access and the peace that comes with that access. Now, he's the word grace here. We have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And my definition of grace it's God's sufficiency for every need. God's sufficiency for every need. God's grace to us is sufficiency for all of our needs. So Christ said, I am the door. So this access is through Christ. He's the door. <sighs> That's good. That's it. Okay. Do you guys know what a biosphere is? 
You know, mm. a biosphere, a big round thing that have plants in it. You can live in a biosphere. And you eat the plants and you, you yeah. pee in it. It fertilizes all the plants. And, you know, well, it's, I've self, it's self seen it in the biosphere. I've seen I it in the pictures. Yeah. Well, that's what we are in Christ. We are self sufficient in Christ. There's nothing else we need. Christ has supplied everything for us. What the scriptures tell us. And he really only gave us two instructions. You guys know what they are? Ask the question again. Love God and love others. Well, that's, yeah, that's true. Oh, when he got okay, something leave, else. Yeah, when he got ready to leave, he gave us two instructions. Go. Before he was taken up in the clouds. Go and make disciples. Yep. Baptizing them. Make disciples, yep. That's it. That's the entire work of the church. Go preach, make disciples. Make disciples. It's not about buying jets for your ministry. It's not about having million dollar mansions for your ministry. It's not about having escalators in your church instead of having to climb the stairs. <laughs> well, then build a single story. <laughs> you know, you can walk up the stairs. I know there's plenty of people out there who can use an exercise. Okay. So if we do anything else besides what Christ has commanded us to do, we get off track. We start to get tossed to and fro. We get away from what the scriptures tell us to do. Make disciples. Teach oh, yeah. Them. So we must preach, get them saved, and then we got to teach them. This is what the church has got to do, be teaching people. And we do not do enough verse by verse, chapter by chapter teaching. So every time I do Romans, it sets people free. Amen. Okay. So we're talking about grace here, which leads us into peace. So let's talk about where grace is found. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. So 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. I'm there. Go ahead. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. Keep there going. you have it. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you want to know what your access is, or what grace is, it's found right there in Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Roger that. <clears throat> you received that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried, and he rose again on the third day. Because of what he did, brought access, it brought grace to us. So we have full access to the Father now, full communication. Full communication. Full communication. So, verse 2, 5 2 says, Through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. So, guys, can you guys quote me near the scriptures where the Bible says, stand, therefore stand? Oh, uh, I, would, I would believe the uh, body of uh, the armor of God, you know. You got it. You got it. It says stand about three or four times there. Yeah, stand. And, and what is the armor? It's the doctrines. It's the teachings of Christ. It's, it's about right. justification. It's salvation. So when Paul's talking about putting on the armor, he's talking about educate yourself into the doctrines and the teachings of what salvation is, what justification is. And a lot of people think it's about putting on a helmet or putting up a sword. or, or No, it's about the teachings. You know, get yourself secure in what Christ has done for us. But Paul is explaining no. Yeah. He says, in which we stand, 
And look at this word, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Rejoice. Behold. Because of this access now, Paul is saying we rejoice in it. Rejoice. I mean, this is talking to a Yahoo. This is yelling. <laughs> popping your hand. Amen. This, this is rejoicing, guys. You have full access by grace, and you stand in it, and therefore you should be rejoicing in this hope, which is the glory of God, that you are justified. You are declared righteous. He has imputed his righteousness to us, to you. He has declared you righteous. Amen. <laughs> It's good. Yeah, man. I mean, I rejoice in it. I rest in this. I, I no longer strive to get closer to God. Do you understand this? I now just rest in my access. I do nothing to try to earn anything. I just rest in it, and I talk with my Father. I just rest in it every single day, and I go, you know, Father, thank you for the access now what Christ has done. And now, Father, I just uh, want to thank you for this, and that, and this, and that. And, oh, yeah, by the way. Uh, this guy's got a hole in his leg. He's got uh, staph in his infection. Touch him, Father God, according to his I use that as an example because Coach has been talking about this, you know, this guy. Right. Anyway. So, and because of this access, it brings peace with God. There you have it. Verse 3. Not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance, character and character, hope. Oh. Okay, look, look at how he, how he brings the sentence in the verse 3. We rejoice in the glory of God and not only that. Not only are we rejoicing, but we glory in tribulations. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. Now, let me say this, guys. This is hard for a lot of people to understand. Yeah, Jeff, go ahead. Oh, it just reminded me, this is almost exactly what Peter says in Second Peter, chapter 1. Almost exactly quote there you go okay let me say this circumstances are not part of the devil or God they are circumstances so a lot of times when we go through trials or tribulations we think they're either initiated by God or they're initiated by Satan circumstances are just circumstances and they are allowed to work in us patience and experience so if you get a flat tire you can't rebuke the devil for giving you a flat tire that's your circumstance that's a nail in the road that's something that took place and you have a flat tire it's a circumstance so the question is when you go through tribulation do you start trusting, screaming, rebuking the devil? Or do you know that tribulation produces perseverance? Are you going to allow character to be formed in you through these times? And that's what it's all about, conforming us into the image of Christ. Okay? Now, this word tribulation. Without teaching about justification, what we're talking about. And this is why Paul goes right into tribulation after justification. Because you have to know the difference of why. He goes right into just into tribulation after talking about justification. Because without this teaching of justification, a person could question their salvation with God. In hard times, listen, 
in hard times, we question our position in Christ. Am I in the will of God? Because of the hard times I'm going through, am I in the, in the will of God? Am I position, positioned in Christ still? Guys, tribulation produces things in us, which we're going to read about. And I, I hear Christians all the time saying, I'm going through this hard time, and I don't know if God still loves me. Well, have they ever read chapter 4 and, and 5, 1, and 2? Do you understand how God is imputed? Do you understand what Christ did on the cross for you? Do you not understand that he said, you will go through tribulation, but be of good cheer? So tribulation is just filled with circumstances in our life. And it's not that God's in it. It's not that the devil's in it. No, it's just sound like Phil okay. Wilson. <laughs> okay. Devil made me do it. Yep. So, uh, people ask me all the time, well, then what is tribulation? Well, if you were to go to Strong's Concordance and look at the tribulation, or any Greek lexicon, you're going to find that, that what I call the best word for tribulation is called pressure. Paul said it was things. When we go through these things, Paul called them things. I, I call it pressure, things that squeeze us. So we all feel pressure at times. And have you guys ever felt that... Uh, it's what I call the, the constant hole in the gut that tells us we're not perfect. You guys ever feel like you're an inadequate to stand before God? You, you guys you guys ever have that feeling? Yeah. Yeah, me too. There's times when I, I feel totally inadequate. And I know I'm a sinner. I know I screw up. But uh -oh. I stand by faith in the promises and the declaration that Christ called me. So it doesn't go by feeling, by faith, I believe that I have access, I believe I am declared, and I, I declare that I have been imputed with his holiness. And when I go through tri tri uh, tribulation and pressure, I praise God. I say, God, I thank you for some of these hard times because I'm being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. I thank you for that flat tire, God. I'm going to get it fixed. I thank you that I slowed down to think through my day, and I'm just going to, I'm going to glorify you, God, for these hard times. And I, I, I don't worry about my hole in my gut, that, I, I, that I'm imperfect. Guys, I'm the biggest screw-up you'll ever meet in the world. Before I got saved, I was like Paul. I mean, I was the worst sinner. And then after I got saved, I was the worst sinner. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and then when I finally understood Romans about justification, sanctification, imputation, I realized that I was the worst sinner. I mean, and then it spelled it out for me. But then I realized I was declared righteous. And then I learned in chapter 6 how not to yield my members to sin. And now I walk in the power of the Holy Spirit every day. I walk in the fruit every day. And we'll, when we get to chapter 6 and 7, eight, I'll explain that even in deeper detail. But to know every single day that you're walking in the fruit of the Spirit is fantastic. Okay. So, let's look at 2 Corinthians 11, 23-27. 2 Corinthians 11, 23. You, you guys got to see this. So, oh, I want you to hear what Paul said. 2 Corinthians 11, 23-27. Oh, 20. And, then we're, and, we'll, and we'll end. 
Okay, who's got it? Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors, more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in death often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods, and once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked at night, and a day I have been in the deep. Keep on going, 26, 27. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among the false brethren. 27. In weariness and toil and sleeplessness, often in hunger and thirst, and fastings often, and cold, and nakedness, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily. My dear concern for all churches. Look at verse 28. He calls them things, besides the other things. Uh -huh. I call it pressure. He calls them things. So I, I don't see him rebuking the devil. I don't see him questioning his salvation. All I see is a deep concern for the churches. Hmm. So did he know who he was in Christ? Absolutely. I mean, guys, if, if the average Christian was to go through 5% of what Paul just named, they would have a nervous breakdown. If the average Christian of today went through half of the stuff that Paul went through, they'd be questioning their salvation. It'd be, rebuking, it'd be rebuking the devil. You know, I mean, they'd, they'd be, you know, back to drunkenness. Paul calls them things. I call it pressure. So, we've now concluded that tribulation is allowed by God. And we are to rejoice in tribulation, knowing that God is working in us. And Jesus said in John 16, 33, you will have tribulation in this world, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So tribulation is under God's control. It's allowed by God or could be even initiated by God to conform us into the image of Christ. So you can't question your position in Christ. You can't question if you are a son or daughter in Christ. You are. This is just called tribulation. So here's the third part of the puzzle. When we seek deliverance, from tribulation or pressure, we are missing faith. Trusting in God, faith pleases God. So if you pray for deliverance from tribulation, it takes the place of faith. So the right spirit would be to take pressure by faith. And this is progression in maturity. And this is how God works. So when you go up in pressure, we go back to Romans 5, and we start to read what happens when we go through pressure, tribulation. So tribulation is what God uses to conform us into Christ. Hebrews 5.8. Hebrews 5.8 tells us that Christ learned through obedience by the sufferings. Whoa! Yeah. The Son of God learned obedience through sufferings? Oh, my gosh. That, I, that was an eye-opener for me. I still don't understand. My mind goes kablooey every time I think about Christ learning obedience through sufferings. Boom. Blows my mind. I, you know? 
crazy stuff. Okay. Let me take you through a couple of uh, scriptures here. Philippians 1, 11, 14. Philippians 1, 11 through 14. Let's go there real quick. Philippians. Let me read these to you. You guys don't have them. Philippians 1, 11 through 14. Anybody got that? I'm um, there. Okay, go ahead. Anybody else want to do it? Okay. Uh, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are our by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have been actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and all the rest that my chains are in Christ. Okay. Mo- yeah. So we discover even Paul said tribulation works out God's will. So the things that happened to me, Paul said. Now, let's go to Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Well, I'm there. Everybody else want to read? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Okay, so he uses the word anxious for nothing. Anxious is distracting care. It means to be drawn in different directions. So don't worry about being drawn in different directions. Don't be anxious. But by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Pray. Don't be anxious. You have access to the Father now because of justification. So since you have access, you can rest in that. You don't have to be anxious. But see, if you never understood chapter 5 of Romans, you'd never understand how not to be anxious. Because you you never understand the imputation. You never understand justification. And what really happened to us. Okay? And we all know what Romans 8.28 says. Romans 8.28 says, all things work together. The good, the bad, the ugly, even the petty stuff. Anyway, good, bad, and ugly. Get it? Yeah. Clint, Clint, uh, okay. So I'm taking some time here in, in, in one and two, and then verse three, because I, I want us to really understand how we rejoice in tribulation. So, really, the term means to glory in it, to boast in it, knowing that. We must understand justification, grace, and then peace. Because tribulation works out God's plan in us. Well, how will people know these things? Only through teaching here. And this is a great place to start. When people are going through hard times, you've got to take them to Romans chapter 5, 1 through 3. So when people are hurting, suffering, going through hard times, you got to take them here. you got to explain to them what imputation is all about because he imputed his holiness to you, because he justified you. You have access now to God. He knows all these things. Rest in him. The devil has no hold on you anymore. You see it? So you could say in the times of fire, man, God is really working in me. I can't wait to see what I'm going to become on the other side of this tribulation. Man, God's really working in me. Right? I hear Christians crying in their their milk. 
<laughs> you like that, God. Deliver me, God, from this hard time. <laughs> you know, I now look at my hard times and I go, man, what am I going to become after this tribulation? How mature am I going to become? Wow, I'm being conformed into the image of Christ after this one. Wow. I'm going to rejoice in this one. I'm, I'm going to glory in this tribulation. You know, guys, let me tell you something. When I had my accident this summer, when I cut my wrist and I cut all my tendons, and they had I couldn't move my hand. They had to repair eight tendons, and I now have no feeling, half the feeling in my hand. I said to God, I was so bummed out. And now I have pain in my hand all the time, and my hands don't close, and in the cold weather, they just ache, and they won't bend. And every once in a while, I find myself saying, I say, God, I just, and sometimes I call myself an idiot. Sometimes I want to flip the finger to the devil. Sometimes I just want to do all kinds of things. Because every single morning, I, I still wake up with it, the pain. But every single morning, I get up. And because I know these scriptures, the first thing I say is, you know, God, you every single day, I have tribulation, I have problems, and you know what, God? You have conformed me into the image of Christ. I am so much more patient now because I, I look at things, I analyze things now. So it was it a bad thing? Yes. Has it turned out for good? Yes. So Paul gets them through the teaching of justification here. He gets them saved, and then immediately he deals with tribulation. Well, Paul is clear and precise here, guys. So study this. I call it just slash trib slash saint. Justification slash tribulation slash sanctification. And sanctification is what we're going to discover in chapter 6. So that's the progression he takes us through. He takes us through justification. He takes us through tribulation. And then he sanctifies us through through sufferings, which we'll talk about in chapter six. Okay, any questions so far? Well, it just, this gives me a statement to give me more confidence. Yeah, good. And, uh, and it, I, I'm pretty much on a courage when I talk to the people, because when I try to talk to them, and and try to encourage them to step out in faith to do what a calling that may be your calling. And he keeps saying, I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. And it's like, and this is a good part to, to bring in there here. Let me give you confidence here. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. <clears throat> okay. So we discovered now through these first three verses that justification is the door by which we enter. It's the rock on which we stand. And it's an anchor for our life and teaching. You've got to understand in fullness what justification really is. The imputation, the access, the declaring, what we all learned in chapter 4, going to chapter 5. So, right. I ask you guys a question. I'm going to show you guys how to deal with this function. Okay? So how do you deal with this function? Because we're all dysfunctional human beings. I'm going to give you five points real quick, just so you have in your notes. So one, the guilt and penalty of sin, the guilt and penalty of sin is the gospel. Do you want to know how to deal with your, with your guilt? The gospel. Jesus Christ died for your sins. Two. How do you deal with power over sin? Romans chapter 6. Three. How do you deal with the presence of sin? That comes in glorification. So the presence of sin will be dealt with in glorification. Four. We must deal with the sin nature issue. We must deal with the sin nature issue. 
has only taught enrollment and how to deal with it. And it's only found in chapter six of Romans. Okay, okay and five. This function is not recovery. And let me explain that. This function is not recovery. If we don't teach people what happened to them in Christ, it's it's like being an alcoholic. People who say, hello, my name is Tim. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a recovering alcoholic. See, if we don't make sure people are safe, if we don't make sure they're safe, we'll be working with non-Christians. And they can't live in victory. Or they will believe they are alcoholics, not sinners. So when it comes to AA, if a person says, hello, my name is Tim, and they're a Christian, I'm an alcoholic, then they are not safe. Yeah. He said, the Bible says, behold, all things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. New. Okay? So either you're saved and you're a new creature in Christ, or you're not saved. So there isn't really anything to deal with when it comes to recovery. Either one, you learn chapter 6, how not to yield your members to sin, and you deal with the sin nature issue of what happened that the old man died. And if a person hasn't been taught that the old man died, they'll never understand how to deal with the sin nature of the flesh. So, so, salvation is not a process. It's faith in what happened to Calvary. Guys, you got to get this straight. Salvation is not a process. It's what happened at Calvary. We are sinners. We're not coming out of something. And this must be taught. We're sinners. We're not coming out of something. Justification has got to be taught. So let me say that justification is not alone. It now will usher in sanctification, which we're going to learn about in chapter 6. And sanctification is the progression of the Holy Spirit in us. And this is taught in chapter to chapter, which we're going to discuss about. Salvation, boom, happens. Sanctification is progressive. Do you guys see the difference? And if that isn't taught, then the person will, will doubt their salvation. Okay. Yeah. Now, Peter talked about what Paul laid out here. And Peter said something. So let's look at 2 Peter 3, 15, 18. Okay, Jeff, this is your book. You just you like Second Peter, you said. <laughs> Second Peter three, fifteen through eighteen. Who's got it? Can you hear me? Yep. Gotcha. Oh, okay. And what's the verses in three? Three, fifteen through eighteen. Oh, fifteen through eighteen. I'm not, not there. Far you there, Lindell? No, I'm not far enough. Go for it, Jeff. I don't want to hog the show here. It's okay. All right. It's the, it's and, not and a it's a Bible study. Okay. <laughs> and, and consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him has written to you as also in his epistles speaking in them of these things in which are some things are hard to understand which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures 
You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. So even Peter said some of Paul's teachings are hard to understand. But if you understand, if you study, you'll, you'll understand them. And nobody, nobody can toss you to and fro. The unstable people twist it. He just said it. Peter said unstable people twist the scriptures. They're always inventing new teachings. No kidding. So these new teachings either come from the flesh, men, or the devil. And the Bible says that the followers of these teachers have itching ears, and they go from place to place to get their ears itched. They want they want somebody to tickle their ears. That's why we have church hoppers. Right. People always go from church to church to hear the new thing. Or two, they don't have a pastor that teaches them. One of the two. Either the pastor not teaching them. Amen. And let me say this. I've said it a hundred times. If it's true, it's not new. And if it's new, it's not true. Why would God wait 2,000 years to reveal a new truth? He hasn't. But right time I hear a preacher or evangelist say, Oh, I have something new from God. I go, because <laughs> there's nothing new man the scriptures tell us exactly what happened yeah okay and if you don't believe me look at first timothy 4 1 and then you don't believe me let me tell you what what first timothy 4 1 says first timothy 4 1 Hey, I think I got that one. Okay, go for it. I charge you, therefore, before God so, and the Lord Timothy, Jesus Christ. First Timothy. First Tim, four one. Well, dang on it. That was a good verse, though. It is. Uh, <laughs> Now, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving do spirits and doctrines of demons. Whoa! Oh, I've Whoa, seen it. Teachings. I'm seeing it. Wow. So some of these new teachings that are coming up are from what? What? Deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons? Holy schnatters. Guys, if that doesn't scare you, if you want to study Romans chapter 5, 6, 7, 8, I don't know what it does. <laughs> okay. So, uh, oh, one more verse. Colossians 1.13. Before we go on. Colossians 1.13. Who's got it? You're going to like this. Colossians 113. Oh, I'm fast. I got it. Go for it. Oh. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Okay. In whom we have redemption oh, through 15? his blood and the forgiveness of sins. 113, but go ahead. Yeah. Oh. Thirteen. He's delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his son in love. Oh, yeah. So here, here it goes, guys. I used to think that Satan could slime us or make us sick, that he had power over the Christian because I read some paperback books about the power. You know, that I could rebuke the devil, I could do spiritual warfare, then I read 1 John 5, 18 and realized that Satan had no hold on me. 
I do not, if I do not sin, First John five eighteen says the Son keeps him. Jesus keeps him. So I've realized now that because I'm justified, I have this access that if I just walk in the power of the Spirit, don't sin. Satan has no hold on me. The Son keeps him. In First John five eighteen, the word "keep" means to watch over him. To preserve him, to keep him in view, to take note of, to watch over, in order to protect. So, with First John five eighteen, is God going to watch over me? He's going to preserve me. He's going to keep watch. He's going to keep in view. He's going to take note of, in order to protect. Whoa! You guys hear that? Amen. Five eighteen. I realize Satan has no hold on me, but the Son keeps him. And the word keep means to watch over him. So Jesus watches over me. It means to preserve him. It means to keep watch in view. It means to take note of. And to watch over in order to protect. So Jesus watches over me to protect me. Right on. You know, and this Greek word is used in Acts 12.6. When they used to guard the prisoners, the same word is used in Acts 12.6. It's used to guard prisoners. It means to keep until the appointed time. It's used at the wedding feast of John 2.10. It's used at John 17.11. That those passing through the world are exposed to temptation and the danger of falling. But it says he will keep you from falling. So when we talk about what justification is, not only does God watch over us, but he keeps us from falling. Amen. Wow. Wow. He is watching over you all the time. So why not trust him? Tell him why not? Yours. Well, shouldn't you fear him too? Why? Well, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yeah. No. So you don't have any wisdom, do you? Well, in the beginning, I, I think got you got some wisdom, wisdom now. Well, if if you if fear is the beginning of wisdom. And you started to fear him and you repented that's a good thing so now what do you do do you do you fear him and so you no longer pray because you fear him well yeah so you can't draw near to him because you fear him right no you got me confused well you just said you fear him so people who fear well, never get close to the person they fear Law about fear to keep obedience. Why do you fear to keep obedience? Why not do it out of love? Because you love him for what he did on the cross for you. I don't fear God. I love him for him dying on the cross, shedding his blood, imputing his holiness to me. He watches over me every single day. So I fear like I can wrap my arms around him. I can put my head on his breast. I allow him to stroke my hair. Mm -hmm. I'm that close to him. Okay. I don't fear him. You know, because fear, the Bible says, deals with punishment. And I don't worry about punishment because I have been declared holy. There's no punishment for me anymore. Make sense? Yep. Because right. I understand justification so well now, I, I don't fear him at all. I'm the brother. I'm a son now. I'm adopted. I'm in a family. All right, now you're making sense. Okay. 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 Thanks for that. So let's keep going over us. Oh, my gosh, we went over. No worries. Um, uh, 
Let me just say this. We'll, we'll end with this. Verse 4. That tribulation produces perseverance, it says in 3. 4. And perseverance perseverance character and character hope so because we now have character forming in us we now have hope so experience and pressure all this pressing together to build our character which brings us hope which we'll talk about next time which we will talk about oppression next week. We'll talk about oppression by war, oppression by childbirth, distress, and so on. So for right now, we'll stop right there with uh, rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. Tribulation. Roger that. Any questions or thoughts or anything you want to add? Not off Great hand. teachings there. Yeah. Yeah, we got through three verses, guys. We did we did semi okay. <laughs> Those are some Amen. awesome verses though. Hey, these are you gotta have this down, man. Exactly. You gotta get this stuff down. Yeah. So it's great stuff, huh? Amen. Okay. Are we off the air? Nope. Let me stop her. Okay, then we can talk about Genesis one real quick for Jeff.